Good afternoon and welcome to the Society of Wetland Scientists September webinar. My name is Kim Ponzio and I'm a past president of SWS and the current chair of the SWS webinar committee and I'm going to be your moderator today. The general format of today's webinar is going to be a 45 minute presentation by our speaker and that'll be followed by 15 minutes of questions and announcements. So we have a great turnout for today's event and I'm excited to offer a special welcome to our non-member guests that are joining today. Today we're hosting our quarterly free webinar that is open to all those interested in wetlands. And our next free webinar will be our legacy webinar held in December with Dr. Paul Ketty. During the other parts of the year, our webinars are complimentary to SWS members only. So before we get started with the presentation today, I'd like to give our guests a quick overview of what SWS is all about. Since its founding in 1980, the Society of Wetland Scientists, or SWS, has continued to grow with more than 3,000 members worldwide. We're committed to providing our members meaningful resources, just like this webinar program, that promote wetland education, conservation, and restoration globally. In addition to the complimentary monthly webinars, SWS membership includes full access to the journal Wetlands, Wetland Science and Practice, and other professional journals, discounted rates for the professional certification program, access to regional, chapter, and section activities, discounted registration at the SWS annual meeting, and the opportunity to network with wetland professionals, professionals from around the world. So please visit our website at sws.org to learn more about becoming an SWS member. And also, we are beginning our membership drive on October 1st, and if you join then, you'll enjoy extra three months of benefits all the way through December 8, um, 2018. So before we get started, let's familiarize ourselves with the GoToWebinar system. On the side of the screen, you'll see that there's a control panel that looks like the example on this slide. And in the audio pane, you can adjust your webinar audio for either using your telephone or your computer speakers. And at any time during the presentation, you can type your questions in that questions pane, and we'll touch that in a minute. Um, our presenter will be answering questions at the end of the presentation. And if you'd like a copy of today's slides, there's a PDF under the handouts pane of the control panel. And as a reminder, we also offer webinar certificates worth one hour of participation upon request. And if you can contact SWS staff if you're interested in those certificates. They're also available for people who watch the recorded mm -hmm. webinars. And all of our webinars are recorded and archived for complimentary viewing by the members on our past webinars page. So for today's webinar, you'll receive a link to the recording at the email in the following the webinar. We also ask that you take a moment to complete the evaluation survey that you're going to get. It'll pop up at the end of, of the webinar. And we also encourage you to use hashtag SWSWebinar on Twitter to tweet about our webinar today. So let's test the questions pane. And at the same time, we'll get a little demographics for who's participating. So if you would just type in your um, state or country you're participating from and how many people are viewing the webinar with you. I'm going to take a little look. I have first one from Houston, Texas, and Ohio, Florida, Canada, and Nova Scotia. Good to know people in Texas have their electricity back from the hurricane. Uh, someone from Botswana and uh, someone from Miami, several people from Miami. So thank you very much for doing that. I can see that we have partic you know, participants from all over the world here. So. With the logistics of this out of the way, we'll get started with our webinar. So it's my pleasure to welcome today's presenter, Dr. Luca Marazzi. Dr. Marazzi holds a Master of Science degree in Environmental Sciences from the University of Milano Bicocco in Italy and a PhD in Freshwater Ecology from University College London. Since January 2015, he's been uh, working as a a postdoctoral associate in Dr. Evelyn Geyser's laboratory at Florida International University, where he's investigating how and why diversity, abundance, and biomass of freshwater microalgae change across space, time, and environmental gradients in subtropical wetlands, such as the Florida Everglades 
and the Okavango Delta in Botswana. His previous studies and research, teaching and consultancy work in Europe, focused on topics such as bird migration, air quality assessments, climate change scenarios, biodiversity and ecosystem services, and sustainability. He's interested in further developing his comparative studies to encompass the analysis of wetland restoration and conservation practices in collaboration with other wetland experts. So with that, welcome Luca, and I will turn things over to you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's, a great, it's a great pleasure to be talking to you all about my research today. Thank you so much, Kimberly, Cara, and the SWS for organizing this webinar. So, subtropical wetlands comparing primary producer diversity and dominance in addressing restoration challenges. It's the title of my talk. You can see some lovely pictures from the Everglades, from the Okavango. You have some algae there, uh, diatoms and desmids, and you have a couple of other wetlands that you may know where they are, but uh, I'm going to leave it uh, to the end to, to say where they are. So what do I do? Let's jump in with the scheme about my work on algal ecology and taxonomy that overlaps with wetland ecology. I will present findings from two of the first um, three papers there, diversity and dominance of algae in these two wetlands, and I will have a slide on the third paper that I'm about to submit. But uh, as I also love science communication, I started the Diatom of the Month blog series, and I will have a slide on it as well. Finally, I have been recently um, expanding my research to encompass wetland restoration and conservation, because I believe that more can be done to protect and restore these ecosystems, especially in the tropics. The key premise of my talk is that diversity and dominance can both support community resilience. And you may have questions about it, I will leave it there, but um, uh, you probably understand what I mean by some of the slides. So it is, it is not an overstatement to say that our lives depend on algae. They produce about 50% of the oxygen in the atmosphere, so every other breath we take, we should thank algae. Humans also use them as food, fuel, and medicines, including for AIDS and cancer treatment. Moreover, these scientists in Australia have just discovered that um, if it wasn't for a rapid burst of algae life triggered by melting glaciers, which increased nutrient supply during the snowball Earth period over half a billion years ago, humans would not be on Earth, period. Think about that. When I read this article, that was quite amazing. So I agree when Chapman says that roses are pretty and oak trees are impressive, but no other groups of plants have done so much for so long and for so many as have the algae. I'm guessing he's biased because he's studying algae and so am I, but there you are. Algae are the crucial base of many aquatic food webs, for example, via feeding fish directly or indirectly via feeding invertebrates that then get eaten by fish. They also provide what I prefer calling life support functions rather than ecosystem services, such as gas regulation and water purification, as well as nutrient cycling and so on. So I got to like my algae in the 130 PSD samples I had to count, uh, especially desmids. And I knew the desmid of the month from my PhD days. In the Netherlands, I have a website with over 180 taxonomic descriptions um, in the last 15 years. Then I thought, hang on, there's no diatom of the month. So I started writing uh, short blog posts for the Wading Through Research Florida Coastal Everglades blog. And here's the link. Uh, please read and share. There's a lot of uh, interesting work shared by mainly graduate students. And uh, the datum of the month will then migrate soon to another website um, together with the International Society for Datum, datum is Research. Datum research. After writing a dozen post my, posts myself, I started inviting guest authors to write articles on interesting spe species just described or particularly useful as ecological indicators. We have had posts on work done in the UK, South Africa, the US, and Malaysia. And it's been a nice journey so far, and uh, we reached thousands of people, raising awareness about diatoms, not just among specialists, especially using uh, social media. 
Now to wetlands, exceptional reservoirs of biodiversity that we need to better understand to predict and manage environmental impacts on them. My key broad research question is how do diversity enhanced by numerous rare species and or dominance by a few tolerant species vary with hydrological and nutrient changes in subtropical, subtropical wetlands? So it's about, you know, um, stresses, uh, lack of uh, nutrients, lack of water, for example, that may induce some species to take over and dominate versus having benign environments where you have a lot of species because the environmental conditions are, are very good. And I'm going to focus on the along the intertropical conversion zone where the Everglades, the Okavango and many other wonderful wetlands in the Congo and South America, Pantanal, uh, Amazon and in Australia are located. So the first paper was a big comparison of algal species richness and life history strategies in the Okavango Delta and the Everglades. These are both subtropical flat pile wetlands, but facing very different environmental pressures, exemplified by the number of tree islands still existing, one per person in the Delta still, and way fewer here in the Everglades. This depends on the about 6 million people living in the uh, Everglades, Greater Everglades uh, region. As, comp as compared to about 150,000 people in the Okavango Delta region itself. That is a much more uh, remote uh, region, of course. Um, so uh, I say here in the Everglades, I'm not <clears throat> in the Everglades right now, of course, I'm in Miami at FIU, uh, but I want to go to the field soon, especially to see the effects of um, Hurricane Irma on the ecosystem. And by the way, I would like to uh, I really hope that uh, Puerto Ricans and uh, Caribbean people can cope with this uh, Maria hurricane they just um, got um, as, much, as well as they can. And the SWS um, meeting in Puerto Rico, San Juan, was, uh, was just amazing earlier this year. So both the Okamongo and the Everglades National Park in particular are Ramsar and UNESCO heritage sites. Hunting has been banned in the Okavango but water diversion and possible global warming induced drying scenarios are real threats. For example, water needs in Angola have been increasing in the past several years after the end of the civil war. But there is a three country river basin, basin commission, OCACOM, that is trying to harmonize water needs of Botswana, Angola and Namibia. So these are stunning images from space and from the air about the fantastic Delta system in the middle of the Kalahari. As you may know, it is the lifting of tectonic faults that stopped the water from flowing into the oceans about two million years ago. The size of the, this Delta varies greatly from about 2,500 square kilometers in the dry season to maximum 12,000 square kilometers in the wet season. The Florida Everglades have been reduced to half, about half of their pre-drainage size, which is now somewhere between uh, five and 6,000 square kilometers. Severe problems include habitat loss, eutrophication with consequent periodic dry and unpredictable algal blooms in the west and east coast estuaries, floods and droughts, and sea level rise. So we have, um, Two wetlands that um, some, at times have, have um, a similar size because maybe we are in the dry season in the Okavango, uh, so the size of that is more comparable to the Everglades. But if we think at the peak wet season maximum of both wetlands, we're talking about um, a twice a, a large an area for the Okavango as compared to the Everglades. And the Okavango is also a little bit steeper in terms of um, um, altitude gradient from the upstream to the downstream areas that the Everglades which was uh, rainfall dependent, whereas the Okavango has always been and still is dependent on the flood path that comes from the uh, Angolan highlands way up there to the left uh, right here, left uh, up here. It takes four to six months for that water to, to fall as rainfall and reach the, uh, the, uh, the delta itself. So with the my PhD and postdoc supervisors, I investigated how species richness varies in these two major wetlands. These are our hypotheses, 
richness increases with higher phosphorus as a limiting resource. As per species energy theory, algal richness is highest where mean depth, depth water, uh, water depth change is intermediate. As per intermediate disturbance hypothesis, algal richness is higher with higher phosphorus and low desiccation disturbance, where competitive and rather old taxa are more abundant than stress tolerant taxa. As per the CSR framework uh, developed for plant, plants by Grime and then um, tailored to um, algae by Reynolds and also Biggs. And richness increases in shallower habitats that are more complex as per the habitat heterogeneity hypothesis. So I merged my large PhD data set with Evelyn Geiser's huge data set. We had 1,077 samples and over half a million algae accounts. Kudos to Frank Tobias for the massive Everglades work. And the uh, sampling methods differed, but we dealt with this by estimating richness with species richness estimators to find the asymptote of the species accumulation curves. We then used various statistical tests, stepwise regressions, and indicator species analysis to test our four hypotheses. <clears throat> and so after um, about 12 years from the first sample collection of these two completely uh, separate uh, studies, uh, here are the maps of algal diversity in these two wonderful places. We found that species richness increased with total phosphorus concentrations in the Everglades and with decreasing depth in the Okavango mostly. The first hypothesis is thus uh, supported, especially in the Everglades, as per my interpretation of species energy theory. Higher phosphorus, higher diversity here in the Loxahatchee water and conservation areas as compared to the Everglades National Park areas. And here, higher diversity in the floodplains, shallow floodplains in the Okavango as compared to the upstream river channels uh, sites. In the Okavango, so um, the, the lower depth um, is caused by evapo-concentration, evaporation, or evapotranspiration, and this causes evapo-concentration of uh, salts, and these salts contain precious micronutrients such as cations and anions. So in a way, the nutrients, um, uh, I think, uh, increase the diversity of algae also in the Okavango. According to the intermediate disturbance hypothesis, diversity should be higher with intermediate disturbance, we measured disturbance as the mean water depth changes in our sampling sites, and we found an increase in richness only in the Okavango, but not following a hump-shaped curve. So our second hypothesis was not supported. Uh, we may actually need to sample with a higher temporal resolution to detect flooding disturbance effects on species diversity. As per uh, useful comments I got also from the uh, reviewers and the editor um, of Freshwater Biology. We expected that richness was higher with higher phosphorus and lower desiccation stress. Here at the bottom right and the top uh, triangle vertices. After classifying dozens of species into competitive, rather all in stress tolerant with indicator species analysis, we did observe a higher richness in sites with longer hydro period and higher TP. And uh, uh, so our third hypothesis was met in uh, both wetlands. And you can see that basically only one species, Eunotsia flexuosa, up here, was identified uh, as competitive, um, basically with this, in the same category, competitive stress tolerant and rather in both wetlands. So there wasn't that much of an overlap between indicator species between the, these two wetlands, but there, there are similar conclusions over the, <clears throat> the richness. Um, and so one stress tolerant species was found, Nizia serpentirafe, in the Everglades and none in the Okavango, as we can see here. Uh, here, desiccation and phosphorus scarcity are much less of a problem, if not a very rare um, problem. So that's the interpretation. Coming to um, our last hypothesis, I thought we would. Uh, find more species in shallow habitats that may offer more substrata for attachment. But in fact, there were no significant differences in species richness in either wetland. 
the habitat heterogeneity hypothesis may need to be tested with quantitative measurements of habitat complexity. And I included um, two quotes um, in, in, the, in the paper of interesting examples of how to measure habitat heterogeneity uh, in the vegetation and um, the, the soil where these algae grow. So <clears throat> other descriptive results from this uh, fresh protobiology uh, publication include the observation that quite logically many more planktonic species and species that may live in the plankton as well as in the benthos in this second uh, part of the histograms uh, exist in the Okavango than in the Everglades. In the, in the delta, we collected samples with water bottles as opposed to beakers of mats for Everglades periphyton, where there are many more benthic species. Remember that we started this project completely separate, my PhD project in 2008, and Evelyn Geyser's lab um, <clears throat> started in 2005 the collection of the periphyton samples. We then gathered the Co collated the data together to make this comparison. So we collected samples with both bottles in the uh, Okavango and the uh, uh, beakers in the Everglades, and part of the difference is due to this. But in many systems, benthic algal communities are like submerged forests, and Martin Kelly is great at representing them in paintings of what we can all we can call basically algal scapes, three-dimensional. Um, basically um, structures of um, stalked and adnate uh, and um, epiphytic, uh, epimenthic and so on, uh, algae, diatoms, desmids and so on. So it's best to basically sample with uh, different methods to make a full assessment of the richness uh, of, uh, of algae. <clears throat> The next few slides are a collection of photos of species and habitats in the Okavango and the additional results from my PhD. Here we see four diatoms, a cryptophyte, a cyanobacterium, and a dinoflagellate. This one here, this one is the cryptophyte. This is euglenas, uh, euglenophyte, and these are diatoms, and this is cyanobacterium. Um, in river channels environments in the northern delta. And here you can see four desmids and three other green algae, mostly living attached or, or around sedges and grasses in the flat plains in the distal reaches farther southeast. These are the species of um, plants that uh, grow there. So from my species richness estimator analysis, I found that there are likely hundreds more species than those we actually observed. So our 496 species and 173 genera is an underestimation of algal biodiversity in the delta, which means more research on this topic should be done, despite the limited, fun, limited funding constraints and the challenges of working in such remote sites. By the way, there is a group of brave researchers and conservationists who are currently canoeing along the Okavango River to collect great data. You can follow them on the into the Okavango expedition on Twitter and Instagram, into the Okavango. Dr. Boyce coordinates this annual uh, effort, I believe. They get funding from National Geographic and so on. We also found that a number of diatoms was more abundant in permanently flooded sites in the northern delta, while green algae were more abundant in the shallower flat plains south. These are remote and amazing places to visit. If you stay at some camps near Maun, you will save thousands of dollars because more, most tourism is low numbers, high revenue, which is good for the environment, but not so much for your pockets. So you can see here, for example, um, hippopaths. So these are where hippo, hippopotami um, move from the channel to the, to the grasslands that they, they feed on. And in, in the field, it was quite amazing to be quite close sometimes to uh, hippos 50 meters from us maybe once i had a giraffe about 10 meters from me <laughs> and uh, our colleague who uh, told us to, to move quite quickly away from there okay so great we are already halfway through and hopefully some of you are still uh, awake let's move to the second published paper on how phosphorus scarcity and desiccation stress increase algal dominance in the everglades this work is all about periphyton mats. I like calling them 
enigmatic carpets of algae because they look like carpets like former MSc student Nick Schulte described them in a TV documentary a while ago and because it's not easy to find out what goes on in there. But these are very important systems that stabilize the soil, regulate nutrients and gases, and provide habitats to many little critters that fish feed on so that the 5% of the birds remaining in the Everglades can keep flying around and tourists can take photos of them. This is an amazing ecosystem with very natural areas still, but a massive impact and massive uh, habitat reduction and species, lo uh, species loss uh, and so on. So our hypothesis here, uh, here were that in the Everglades habitats with several severe phosphorus limitation and desiccation stress, the top five taxa comprise a higher share of the total biovolume, number one. Fewer taxa dominate the total biovolume, hence evenness is lower. And adaptive traits allow these taxa to dominate biovolume, a way to measure biomass. Franco and his colleagues collected samples um, between 2005 and 2011 by helicopter. I then joined in from 2015 a few times a year, but this data is only up to 2011. To reach uh, three, four, five sites per day in the comprehensive Everglades restoration plan, monitoring assessment plan, SERP map program, I still get this acronym wrong. Sometimes data on phosphorus depth, algae counts and biovolume were gathered. This is the same data set I used for the previous comparative paper, but employed to answer Everglades specific questions. We found that indeed the percentage by volume represented by the top five taxa, those with the highest by volume, increased with lower phosphorus and longer annual dry periods, as you can see here, drier conditions, increase of dominance, less phosphorus increase of dominance. And also with shorter times elapsed since the last dry day. I don't have the graph, but it's in the paper, Aquatic Ecology. So our first hypothesis was supported by the data. Consequently, evenness decreased with lower phosphorus and longer dry periods, but less markedly than top five biovolume percentage did. So it makes sense that you have uh, more dominated uh, samples here and you have a uh, um, a lower evenness, you have higher evenness where the dominance is lower and conversely uh, the other way around for the dry conditions. So another, you can also see um, in this uh, set of graphs showing the number of species accounting for 95% of the biovolume, which is another measurement linked to evenness that I came up with. And these trends are comparable and the first one was the other way around because dominance is inversely correlated with um, evenness and richness. So third hypothesis supported, that's great. In case you are wondering, I do have photos of uh, Everglades. Oh, actually, this was the second hypothesis, there's a mistake there. Um, in case you were wondering, I do have phot photos of Everglades algae as well. Here are some of the dominant ones, cyanobacteria, diatoms and one green alga. There is this Mogiosia, this is diatom, this is another diatom, and these are uh, cyanobacteria. This is, uh, so this is in Cyanema Bergardinium and this is Mastogloria calcarea, they are endemic diatoms. The next step was to understand why some of these algae are dominant. So we looked at their traits and found that Resistance to desiccation, heat, and UV radiation is countered by scatonema, scatonema, the most dominant taxon, using a protective pigment called scatonamine. As you can see, the longer the dry periods, the higher the abundance of this cyanobacterium in our samples. Our other strategies include the production of mucilage by cyanobacteria in diatoms, such as Mastogloria calcarea, that makes the periphyton mass cohesive, thus retaining nutrients and water. This species was described by Sylvia Lee during her PhD with uh, Evelyn Geiser. Dr. Lee now works for the US EPA. From a landscape viewpoint, I made this map for the annual Florida Coastal Everglades 
meeting to show how the dominance trends are exactly opposite to the species richness trend I showed in the first part of my presentation. So in the water conservation areas, one, two, and three, one, two, three, up here, the top species, top five species comprise a higher share of the total biovolume, and so to speak, we also need more species to make up 95% of the biovolume as per the graph on number of taxa equal 95% of the biovolume. But so that's related to richness. This is the dominance which increases toward the Everglades, Everglades National Park areas. What happens is that in the deeper areas up here with higher phosphorus, we have more coccoid cyanobacteria and green algae, including my beloved desmids, because the periphyton matrix dissolves due to heterotrophic bacteria better competing for excess phosphorus than eukaryotic algae. Down here in Everglades National Park instead, we have species that can potentially fix nitrogen and most importantly possess these photoprotective pigments that allow them to outcompete or reduce the abundance of eukaryotic algae like diatoms and uh, green algae. So my take home messages for, from these two papers are, we estimated that the Okavango Delta had an average of 76 algal tax size compared to 21 only in the Everglades. This means algal species richness depends on micro and macronutrients in these wetlands. And then I strongly believe that comparative studies can help identify any general effects of changes in hydrology, hydropower plants, for example, upstream in the Okavango River Basin and restoration in the Everglades. Also nutrient load and global warming have effects on algal diversity, dominance and species distribution in subtropical wetlands. And from a conservation standpoint, maintaining or restoring the natural flood paths and the water quality is crucial to supporting native algal communities, whether they are dominated by a few species like in the Everglades or more diverse in the Okavango. So we can manage for high diversity where there's a lot of species, but sometimes we need to manage for the um, low diversity uh, sites with native species that dominate, creating these cohesive benthic mats of algae that I think are quite nice and fascinating. Okay, I only have a slide on this uh, next manuscript that I'm going to submit maybe even tomorrow. Our hypothesis were that datum community composition was stable across seasons in response to low interseasonal environmental variance, core species being very um, abundant and common present in main samples. Foundation species play a stronger role uh, community building than the other dominant diatoms. And then a stronger spatial gradients in uh, nutrient concentrations and hyd hydrology developed in the Everglades. And these mostly drove the abundance of these common diatoms, including the core species. I intend to present this work when published or during the review process sometime next year, uh, maybe in uh, Canada for ASLO or maybe in Colorado for SWS. Possible future research directions include developing common study design research in other subtropical wetlands, such as the Pantanal and the Kakadu. These are the wetlands that were depicted in a couple of pictures in the first slide. And, um, you know, I don't know about you, but I would love to visit there, uh, visit these wetlands even just for tourism. Um, the forested um, floodplains in the Pantanal should be uh, extremely fascinating. and the uh, drier areas of the Kakadu with lots of rocks as well. Also dangerous places though, with lots of wildlife. Also, it would be interesting to measure habitat complexity to test more quantitatively its effects on diversity, as well as developing uh, competitive stress tolerance or rather on classifications, uh, regardless of whether they are in the benthos bent or in the plankton. Uh, most, most work more works basically focus on either benthos or plankton. I think it's quite interesting to put together all the data we can get from uh, algae living in the water or attached and see what um, what they show. Plus, I'm intrigued by how the number of species is very high for algae, as you can see in this graph to the right. It decreases 
for uh, small consumers, but then it increases again for birds, for example, secondary or tertiary consumers. And this is a review paper on um, subtropical wetlands published by Jung Katal, and including my former co-supervisor, Lars Rambert, who directed the Okavango Research Institute uh, during my PhD. Okay, moving on to the last paper I want to talk to you about today. Um, I'm a firm believer in the power of science to support informed decision making and so I'm recently exploring a new, new research path regarding wetland restoration and conservation effectiveness. From the Great Intercol Wetlands Conference in Changshu, China, which is the first proposed wetland city in the world, I kept in touch with colleagues in Australia and China and US for a special issue contribution that originally was meant to stem from our workshop on next generation wetland scientists that we had in Changshu, but then became about whole river perspectives for challenges of wet watershed management. And it's led by Beth Middleton, US uh, GS, for Bob Costanza's new and innovative journal solutions. So the idea for this paper I'm writing with Max Finneson and others, including Evan Geiser and John Kominowski, is to take stock of lessons learned from wetland restoration case studies from around the world and propose ways to more effectively or rapidly succeed in uh, wetland restoration science and practice, especially in subtropics. Looking at some wetland facts, we can realize how many and large Ramsar sites uh, there are in the subtropics out of the total 19 million square kilometers of the Ramsar sites, of the uh, wetland areas, sorry, but up to 87% uh, of the global wetland area may have been lost. So I made this quick calculation. We could have had um, 40 to 150 million square kilometers of wetlands to conserve, use sustainably and love, though many want to drain them. So the Ramsar Convention protects over two of these 19 million square uh, kilometers, 70% of which in Africa, Asia, and Latin America and the Caribbean. Here are some numbers showing that just small percentages of land in each nation tends to be protected under Ramsar. I will get back on this. Now, when we have degraded wetlands, we can forget about them or we can try to restore them. But what and whom for? do we want to restore these wetlands? I like this new definition of ecological restoration, the process of assisting the recovery of degraded, damaged, or destroyed ecosystem to reflect values regarded as inherent in the ecosystem and to pro provide goods and services that the people value. And, and uh, um, But we uh, need to address uh, deficit, deficit, deficits and pitfalls that Max and I are trying to categorize in knowledge, management, science management, and integration, communication, funding, and policy. We are gathering information on relevant case studies, restoration success in the Kissimmee River, for example, or, or mangrove restoration in East Africa, and wetland restoration in the Murray Darling River Basin in Australia. So please do get in touch with me if you have any useful information on what can make wetland restoration succeed. This solutions journal uh, edited by Costanza wants papers to focus two-thirds of the length on solutions. That's quite uh, innovative. So despite the considerable number and size of Ramsar protective wetlands, we see a problem in having the national governments that initiate the process of Ramsar site designation also monitor prog progress implementation. Can we rely on government's bona fide decisions on the wise use of wetlands to stop excessive, wasteful, and or illegal resource use and its impacts. I'm not sure about that. But the case studies can um, highlight what's happening in, in the real world. Case study close to me is the Everglades restoration, including the restoration of flow of clean fresh water, fresh water to the Everglades where land or wet lands like Bill Mitch uh, proposes, are needed to store excess water. Clean freshwater benefits ridge and slough pattern landscape, the original natural landscape of the Everglades, estuaries, and Florida Bay 
for example, by countering um, hypersalinity. So up here, there has been quite a lot of success. And down here, not so much because of a lot of uh, lobbying and interests, but um, progress is being made um, a bit slowly with the 68 projects, um, including the Tamiami um, Trail Bridge uh, extension that is that has started. So things are happening. They do need to happen faster. So po possible ways uh, forward include reforming the policy settings, creating fair and transparent monitoring and assessment programs that define measurable conservation and restoration success for Ramsar Convention signatory parties to agree on. So, you know, why not? What if protecting and using sustainably wetlands is or was among government's priorities? This should be among government's priorities because it, it um, really affects people's livelihoods, not just the nice birds and um, plants around. So wetland degradation has to be avoided, mitigated and compensated for in this order. I really love this, this, uh, uh, this sentence, this, uh, this phrase by Alexander McInnes and McInnes. Oh, by the way, um, I think I'm going to send the link to the survey that McInnes and, and others uh, put together that closes uh, at the end of September, where they want people to qualitatively assess the status of uh, wetlands around the world, uh, wetlands that they know, they're familiar with, just by filling a 10 minute survey. It's in the wetland science and practice. Uh, and management and bulleting of the SWS as well. I have uh, two more slides. So here I want to show you a part of the Changshu Declaration. I was very pleased that the conference leaders accepted my suggestion to uh, add unique biodiversity here to the statement on the importance of wetlands um, right here. So invest in the conservation, wise use and restoration of wetlands for their unique biodiversity, carbon capture and, and storage, and to reduce climatic variability and water risks. So dozens of people contributed to this uh, um, declaration that was led by these uh, authors here. So we must not forget the intrinsic value of nature and uh, it is not just there to serve us. The ecosystem services trade often implies or is used for, for that. Uh, there was a cool editorial about this um, services and biodiversity uh, perspectives by Cardinale in Frontiers, um, I think a couple of uh, issues of last issue. So I want to thank my PhD and postdoc advisors, especially Evan Geiser, my postdoc advisor, UCL and others who funded my field trips and conferences over the years, my employers whom I worked for to support myself in London, and my family who was among the funders of my part-time PhD. My colleagues in Botswana, FIU and our current funders and colleagues. So with that, I will take any questions and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Luca, for giving us this presentation. Um, I do have a few questions. I'm gonna just go ahead and jump right to them because we are on perfect timing for, for the questions. Um, so the first question, um, is do you think that the presence of a stress tolerant species in the Everglades is indicative of the amount of urbanization that has occurred there? I think I missed the very first part of the question, sorry. Okay, it says, do you think that the presence of a stress tolerant species in the Everglades is indicative of the amount of urbanization that has occurred there? Um, so the, the not stress really. stress tolerant algal species. No, not really. Uh, it's more about the desiccation that these uh, wetland faces, especially due to the lack of fresh water that is not being uh, delivered uh, south, or not enough of it is delivered delivered south to keep the um, the, the water level uh, and the amount of fresh water in the, in the national park. So, so you know, these native communities have water delivery yeah. than, than than nutrient enrichment. It's it's both, you know, these algae can tolerate um, low phosphorus and desiccation stress, but more, more work needs to be done to basically um, um, experimentally, I guess, measure these pigments that protect the algae from desiccation and um, 
uh, to find out um, if it's more the phosphorus scarcity or more the desiccation. But we, I think with this um, aquatic ecology work, we highlighted how um, our species data suggest that um, uh, desiccation is, uh, is, is quite, may be quite important. Mm -hmm. So let's move down to the Akavango. It's uh, the next question. Uh, so, so which nutrient would you say is limiting phytoplankton communities in the Akavanga Delta? <clears throat> Good question, and uh, I I wrote um, parts of the interpretation um, of my PhD work in the 400 plus uh, pages thesis. <laughs> I still have to publish some of that, but basically, um, there is co-limitation of nitrogen and phosphorus in some areas of the delta and there is uh, more of a phosphorus limitation in other areas and so um, I think the um, northernmost parts the upstream areas of the um, Okavango may have more of a co-limitation and the southern areas are more limited by phosphorus but um, I can also double check on that. Thank you. I, that's interesting because you're thinking of a much different system from the Everglades, which is rainfall driven. And this is more of this, uh, uh, I guess, flooding pulse that would make a difference in the uh, different uh, nutrient limitations because of where they are located in the delta as they go down the, uh, yes. the uh, river there, down the um, topographic gradient. Yeah, but basically the way we, we deal with the limitation, we can look at the N2P ratio and there's a paper by Abel et al. in 2010 that set some thresholds above which there's co-limitation and below which there is uh, mainly phosphorus limitation. Mm -hmm. Mainly phosphorus. Okay, um, I have a, a question here is, uh, why is there such a big difference in species richness between the Akavango and Everglades? Okay, so Why do you that's, think uh, is much more diverse? So this is, uh, okay, partly we have different methods and so we were explicit in our, um, in our paper that the methodological differences uh, always matter in what the results people find. So it takes many studies to sometimes agree on uh, something conclusively. But um, if we did uh, standardized research um, with the similar protocols, for sampling and analyzing the algae, um, we may find that the lower richness in the Everglades may not be due just to the extreme oligotrophy, low phosphorus availability, but also to its young geological history, a few thousand years, as compared to two million years for the Okavango, and the fact that it's a peninsula. So there might be some issues with the dispersal of species from different um, biogeographical regions. So I think you went out a little bit, but you were saying uh, because of, the, not necessarily just because of the leotrophy, but also because it's a younger ecosystem? Uh, that... young geologic, younger geologic, geological history, and the fact uh -huh. that it's a, it's a peninsula, and so maybe um, there is um, a lower, um, 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 the lower amount of species that disperse from uh, different biogeographical regions uh, to it. Um, but these are all kind of larger scale questions that could be investigated by comparing um, data on species regions from many more wetlands around the world at different um, latitudes as well. And there are actually papers talking about how the diversity of diatoms changes from low to high latitudes and I don't remember the details but they're very interesting. More um, work to so do. I have, <laughs> right and I was thinking about this when you said something about getting um, other restoration projects uh, in Costanza's Solutions magazine um, and I have one just up the road from you the Upper St. John's River Basin. <laughs> It's yep. one of the largest restoration projects in the state, if not the country, and so that would be something we'd be willing to offer up information there in our place for uh, some some uh, sampling of algae. <laughs> if you want to come on up. Um, 
Yeah, but so at, at the moment, this, this paper requires information on uh, stuff that uh, is known already. So I don't know ex exactly about the deadline, but hopefully there will be another couple of months to finalize this submission. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So Could just thinking about those two aspects. Right. Okay, also um, wanted to ask you, what are possible future scenarios for dominance patterns in microbial communities in benthic systems? So, um, there's evidence that lakes and estuaries are becoming warmer, more polluted, and more saline. And uh, here, my, my, my crop, microscopic primary producers are also likely to increase. Um, work published by Kerry, Cosmo, Perl as well, and also biological soil crusts with water scarcity. Early succession by cyanobacteria are becoming more dominant than late succession primary producers such as mosses and lichens, and this uh, might be linked also to global warming and, and so on and drying scenarios. Um, also in the tundra, um, shrub um, with experimental warming, dominance was observed to increase. So in different ecosystems in different latitudes, um, it may be the case that there are uh, stressful or more stressful conditions that are um, causing the diversity to decrease and some of these species to tolerate uh, these conditions to become dominant, um, which um, may be problematic if then condi conditions revert and let's say get wetter and so on. So we need enough species to, in the species pool, to cope with changes um, through time. Uh, so it might not be so good to have just a few stress tolerant species that dominate everything. Okay, I think I have one last question and um, I was wondering if if you could elaborate on the importance of people values in ecological restoration. We talked about um, the restoration projects and the uh, the wetland wetland city from Chengshu, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Yes, yeah, so the importance of people values. People values, yes. So um, residents and businesses, um, tourism industry, agriculture. Water managers, conservationists, taxpayers may consider more or less highly the intrinsic values of a wetland. So, that, for example, the cultural ecosystem services and its tangible assets, they may focus more on that. So, uh, fish um, and other valuable um, things like food or fuel, wood, and so on. So, stakeholders definitely clash. And a case in point is the Everglades with, you know, the uh, agricultural industry, sugar cane producers, and uh, also the cattle rangers and so on, north of Lake of the Chobe. Um, but then if we think about ecotourism, sustainable practices and sustainable agriculture in areas around uh, the Everglades or around um, uh, other major wetlands or smaller wetlands, then we can find the um, compromise between the protection of biodiversity and the ecological character for the Ramsar Convention and the livelihoods of people that can live with this ecotourism and sustainable agriculture um, economic activities. Well, thank you for that. And I think uh, we have about five or six minutes left. So I would like to um, thank you, Luca, and let me just go on to a couple of uh, announcements that I have. Um, let's see if I have control back here. If I don't, I'll ask you to. There we go. Oops. So um, I just want to invite everyone to our next webinar that will be held on Thursday, October 26 at 1 p.m. Eastern uh, by Dr. Matt Kerwin, talking about marsh responses to sea level rise. And if you think you'd be interested in presenting an SWS webinar or you have a topic of interest you want us to cover in our webinar series, just indicate that on the evaluation survey that you'll receive after the conclusion of the webinar, or you can contact SWS headquarters. And it's never too soon to put this on your calendar. The May meeting for the SWS annual meeting is going to be May and June of 2018 in Denver, Colorado. Sounds like Luca is ready to present some information there already. 
um, which is good because now the meeting website is live and you can visit swsannualmeeting.org um, to stay up on all the developments. And in fact, the program committee is calling for symposium and workshop proposals now until October 16th. Um, so lastly, I just want to thank you, Luca, for taking the time out of your busy schedule and, and glad that you got electricity and everything back in time <laughs> after Hurricane Irma to put on this SWS webinar as planned. And thank you I also much. want to thank our audience. Go ahead. No, thank you very much. And also I wanted to say that um, if um, our colleague from Botswana who was following wants to uh, follow up with, I think, his question, uh, or, or get in touch, that would be great. And everybody, anybody else who's, uh, um, who attended and had any questions or doubts, um, uh, I could um, follow up with uh, more precise information wherever I didn't give enough information. Would you like to provide your email address? Yeah, it was in the first slide. I should have put it in the last slide as well. <laughs> That's okay. So, uh, I can go ahead and uh, tell them and they can get it online. Yeah, in the air. <laughs> L-M-A-R-A-Z-Z-I -Z -Z and at um, F-I-U dot E-D-U. Great. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Luca. And I hope everybody can join us for the upcoming webinar in October. And that those of you who are not members will visit our website and consider joining SWS. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Kim.